So, all right, so we're going to go on the record, and I have Senator Ken Rosenboom with me today, and, and we're going to to talk about his unretirement. So, uh, Mr. Rosenboom, could you can it kind of maybe uh, set us up a little bit about where we're at now? Well, of course, this all started with the redistricting process that we completed in late October, and at that time... Um, the, those new maps can be harsh to people. And uh, I particularly uh, was affected in a very significant way because I lost about 75% of my constituents. I lost four counties. I picked up four new ones and that sort of thing, which is fine, but it changes uh, how you do things. I've been driving to Centerville and Alvia for 10 years in Ottumwa and so forth, and I'm losing all those districts, and then my new district would include Fairfield and Mount Pleasant and Kiyosaka and, and that part of the Sigourney. So, uh, and I was thrown in with another uh, colleague, and it's uh, Republican Senator Adrian Dickey from Packwood. So I had a decision to make then whether to primary him. I won't get into all the weeds of how this all works, but I would have to primary him and then run in the general election again in, uh, in November. And... So, um, in early December, I decided to retire and just not, uh, not force an election, a primary election. Adrian does a good job. And I had been encouraged to establish residence in the new Senate District 19, which includes Pella, well, it includes the western half of Mahaska County, Pella, most of Marion County, and all of Jasper County. And I really didn't give that a thought. My wife and I like our love our acreage and, uh, you know, by normal standards, we're retirement age. Uh, so I just decided to retire. And then I uh, was uh, happily contemplating retirement up until about two weeks ago. Now, the rest of the story is I have an interest in who represents that area, the, this area going forward, I, Pella's been in my district for 10 years, and I know I have a lot of relationships there, so I have a, a vested interest in what's going on there. There is an announced candidate for that seat, um, but folks were looking for alternatives, which is the way it works, and uh, uh, no other alternatives showed up, and then suddenly it just uh, became a a question for me, well, maybe I should consider this. I have such a, I have a long record of working with agriculture, notably, with water quality issues. I'm a pro-life guy. The culture concerns me. And, and all, I've been on the education committee uh, for most of those years. So there, you, you take a lot of ownership of those, you build a lot of relationships. And uh, over the last two weeks, I talked to my wife about this, and I talked to my siblings, and uh, it, it, it culminated in me deciding to, maybe I'm not going to retire yet. So, kind of awkward, but that's how we got here. So, are you looking for a new residence? Does your current residence work? Um... Well, no. My current, well, we're going to keep our current residence. We love our acreage. We've got 23 years of vested interest in that as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I will establish a residence in the Senate district, and I don't know where that's going to be. We, have to, we haven't started that process yet. Uh, Pella is a likely area, but, uh, you know, Beacon, Beacon's in this new district too, by the way, Ken. Yeah. So, uh, so we don't know what that looks like, but certainly I'll follow the requirements of the law on that. So I will be able to keep some of my same constituents in Western Mahaska County and part of Marion County. Well, the nice part is we'll be able to add an extra four seat probably up there to the to the to the uh, marquee under there. At we will, we will. I thought about that. There would be two senators again. Yeah, it's and been a while since we've been able to enjoy that. Let's see. I, I need to think this through. There will be two senators, and I guess still just two representatives. The way the lines are drawn. Yeah, yeah, it, it, but it's been 10 years since we've it's had... It's 10 years. It's 10 years. That's hard to believe. So if people are like, oh, well, he's moving just because, uh, as you kind of for, for mentioned, you've had a lot of business relationships, personal relationships. I think you... Did you sit on the school board for... 
um, the Christian school, which well, I did on the Christian school. I've never been on the public school board. Okay. But uh, that's the striking thing, and is that you develop so many relationships within the district. And and what was I didn't expect was that when when that comes to an end, you realize how much value those relationships are to you. And people in Centerville and Albia and in the Tumble area, Blakesburg. But uh, of course. I will lose a lot of those, but I'll retain a lot of them in Mahaska County and Marion County as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, this process, it's good. I'm not going to criticize the process. I do believe that the district, this, the rural areas, the rural legislative districts change too drastically. Uh, people have a chance every two years or every four years to decide whether, who they want to represent them. And this just throws all those relationships up in the wind and you start all over again. So I, I, I think we could improve that, but it is what it is now, and I, I, uh, I respond accordingly. But I was going to say, the majority of the population shift tends to be in the more urban sorts of areas versus rural areas. So Yes. But to elaborate just a little bit, and I mentioned this, agriculture uh, in Oskaloosa, in my current district, uh, we all uh, make assumptions about agriculture. It's a big part of the local economy. But when you're in Des Moines and you're dealing with people, you know, the, the large population base in Iowa is largely metro anymore. And, uh, and, and, and many people don't understand agriculture very well. I mean, and that's, that's no fault of their own. I don't understand plumbing very well. But uh, it, it's... Uh, it's important that we can retain strong agricultural uh, presence in the legislature, and notably, I I've worked on agriculture and livestock issues, and will continue hope to continue to do that. So, uh, we remember we take a step back a, a few weeks ago to a particular incident at the last eggs and issues, um, and yes. I think I think a lot of people had some some compassion for you because that was, that was definitely not a normal Oskaloosa event <laughs> there. Did, did those sorts of episodes, because I know that you faced this before, did those sorts of episodes either encourage or, or had they originally maybe discouraged you from, from maybe being an elected official? No, they've never discouraged me. Uh, the good Lord bless me with broad shoulders. I knew when I came into this, what, you're going to take some arrows from people. Uh, this has become a bit more harsh than I ever expected. These folks are out of San Francisco. Uh, despite what they tell the world, they're not animal welfare. Uh, they're not concerned about animal welfare. They're trying to drive the meat industry out of existence. So we need to be very clear about that. And there, that maybe is almost the most powerful example of why I'm running again. Because I will not let those folks intimidate me. Um, and that demonstrates that what I just talked about, the, the, the lack of understanding by some about agriculture and the need to be a strong voice to defend agriculture. So, uh, and I will say in no small part what, what we witnessed in Oskaloosa a couple of weeks ago uh, does not drive me away. It drives me back and saying, we need to stand strong. So it's part of the, that's actually part of the equation. Well, I wondered if that was gonna gonna play a factor, um, probably, in in your decision to uh, yeah. Yeah. to uh, re- return to the Senate. As uh, recently as last night, I got an email from a lawyer in in uh, New York, uh, demanding open records uh, files from me uh, related to this group of people. Okay. So it's real. So. Uh, yeah, you face those those sorts of challenges. Um, Iowans every day, we we don't experience those outside entities pressuring us most of the time. Um, but internally here in Iowa, are, are you seeing an ability for for groups and, and people to be able to not get along? So I'm gonna I'm gonna point at, at recent school board activity sure. even here locally. How do we address that? I mean, do you address that as a legislature? Do you do you 
hand as much local control back to school boards as possible? How, how do we well, how do we strike a balance with a this? A fair question and, a, and really a burning question. And obviously, it's, it's a question of our times because this has played out not just in Iowa, but across the country. And I love our education system, our public schools. As I've told many people that sometimes accuse me of hating teachers or, or, or not supporting the schools, it's simply not true. Uh, I don't assign guilt or blame to groups of people. I do assign guilt or blame to individuals that get out of line. And I can demonstrate to anybody that thinks they want to know where some in the school districts have crossed a line, both in terms of, of teaching things like critical race theory or... Uh, more notably right now, the, the, the school, the content of some of the books in school. Um, I will tell you, Ken, that what's a little frustrating to me is that, uh, I'm not picking at you, I'm talking about this in general, news organizations that like to write about this and they like to complain about this senator said that and that sort of thing, will never publish the content of those books in their publications. And if they did, then we could have an honest conversation about this. Mm -hmm. We throw out general terms like book banning, which we're all opposed to, and uh, and that sort of thing. Well, that's not helpful. Let's let's let the public know what the content is that's really in, in, in uh, at the at the base of the argument. So, so do you find that? Um, and I and I'm just gonna say, I mean, we start back, I would say, almost 10 years ago. All of this has its its roots further than that, but where groups of individuals, the sides, will just say R's and D's are becoming more extreme on each side, and we're not finding people that can right. can come into the middle and say, hey, here's, here's a way to compromise. Are we finding now that if you scream the loud from the left and the scream the loudest from the right, that... It's just a different way of doing things, and we're ending up with, with, I guess, more hostility versus actual grab a cup of coffee and work the difference out. Well, there's no question that has changed. Um, in some respects, I've, I knew a lot of legislators way before I was ever in this business, and I used to go to the Capitol, and the, the environment was different then. There was a different way of conducting business. And some of the old timers will point to certain things that, that changed. Uh, most notably, by the way, the limitation on take and legislators taking gifts in that more than two dollars and ninety nine cents because apparently back in earlier times, citizens could come up and take their legislator out to dinner and they could talk about the issues. And sometimes those would be bipartisan. You know, there would be groups of people that both parties. And I'm to, that was before my time up there, but I'm told by those that have been around a long time that it was a different atmosphere then. Well, if Joe Biden's inflation continues, I won't be able to buy you a $3 cup yeah, of coffee right. any longer. So. <laughs> right. uh, and by the way, your cup of coffee was brought in by you today, so if anybody's curious. It was. I have my own uh, Casey's concoction that I'm partial to. Uh, but I want to make one more comment on that, Ken. It's actually another reason I'm running. Um, I'm sure some people won't agree, but I think I've developed a reputation in the Capitol for, for being a, a pretty good listener. And also is one that uh, tries to pull people together instead of tries to drive them apart. And, and it's pretty obvious if you're up there, uh, those that are constantly throwing firebombs and, and caustic comments, I'm not one of those. And uh, we're all human. You know, I wouldn't say I haven't ever been out of line, but I think I've kept that under control pretty good. So uh, civility is a big deal, and respect for, uh, for others 
is uh, is, a, is the currency of the realm there. If you don't have respect, you don't have much power. So I was going to say the, the, the session kind of started off with a bang, and, and I asked you about it at, at Eggs and Issues. Uh, but uh, some commentary that was made about Iowa teachers, the media, um, I know that there's... And, and the media mm -hmm. uh, is filled with people that are... I don't even want to... I don't know. How, the best way to describe it is it's that left and that right media groups that they, right, they right. all yell as yeah, loud as yeah, they can. Yeah. And uh, here in Oskaloosa is an example, a left-leaning news organization threw out a bomb. It was, I think, last mm -hmm. night a, a rebuttal bomb was 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 lobbed okay. in, in response to that. So what we're finding is, is we're not, people don't want to hear what's in the middle they right. like the sensational right. side right. that but right. how do how do we how do we end that how do we how do we go you know that's really not the best way to do things how you know let's 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 sit together at the table well that's a good question and if, if you can provide the answer for me i'm all ears i i will i will lay a lot of the blame at social media because it's easy to be a keyboard warrior and and go online and say and Anything you really want to say, you know there won't be any physical repercussions. Uh, I, I think that's uh, obvious, should be obvious. And the other thing, I, you mentioned news organizations. You're in the news business, and, and you're right. That is polarized. Now, I, I've never found you to be that person. I, I've always considered, I mean, I was in local politics here I and, and in the state, and you and I have had... Dozens of great conversations. But uh, just this week in one of our local newspapers, there was an assertion made that's flat out patently false. So we can't have that. I, I think the biggest concern I have is the fourth estate, the, the, the press picking sides. Because they have always reminded us that they're there to keep people like me honest, and boy, they better. That's that's their job. But when they've lost their objectivity, when they're suddenly not reporting news, but reporting opinions, then we've lost something. That's my biggest fear, actually. Yeah, I, I tell people, my wife can vouch for this, I tell people that I blame a lot of discourse in our country on 24-hour news cycle, which yeah, that, is not really news cycle anymore. It's a 24-hour talk program. Yeah, that's what and, it is. And, and I'll... Any radio station that runs the 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 talk shows are just as responsible because they they like to inject it as it's news yes. and it's not news. And it, I remember back in the day listening to the old AM radio in my dad's pickup truck. It used to be talk radio, and right. it was very explicit that that's talk radio. Yeah, and that's really been blurred. And, and oh. I think that line between what is news and what is talk and opinion is very marginalized it's, now. Yeah, it's been blurred. So how do, how do we, as a, as, a, as a people, as a government, as news agencies, how do we, how do we write ourselves? How do we, so, that, so that we can seat a press corps within the, the Iowa Senate, within the Iowa House? How do, how do, do we have a way to say, you know, you, you've proven yourself as... Well, specifically to that point, and I don't have control over that, uh, that was originally in, in the Senate was driven by the COVID thing. We changed everything mm -hmm. when we came back. Uh, I'm not sure it's about that anymore. Um, but actually, that's a pretty good example of of how we polarize because that was uh, that was a I don't I won't I don't know who started, but I it, that was a pretty good example of of making, a, I think, a mountain out of a molehill. I may have said that at Eggs and Issues. Uh, I have been, always have been totally accessible to the press. I mean, we have, you, you can't get, we're busy, right? But yeah. uh, if people want to come to the Capitol, if the press want to come to the Capitol, I go outside that rotunda dozens of times every day because I get a request to go out there from lobbyists, from constituents, from school kids, whatever, and from news reporters. I'm always there. Um, 
I don't think I've ever had an issue reaching in absolutely, absolutely unannounced most of the time, um, which is probably to the bane of most legislators that I try to speak. No, but, but that's the way it works up there, whether it's you as a, as a media person or if it's a school child or, or a constituent or a lobbyist. There's a procedure up there that, hey, I want to talk to Senator Rosenbaum. So the pink slip comes into me, and, and if I can, I'll go out and visit with whoever's there. I was going to say, I've shared my, 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 spent my share of time standing at that desk yeah. filling out slips yeah. to talk to people. So, uh, so you know, I, I just find it, they all have my phone number. They all have my email address. There's any number of ways a reporter can get a hold of me. Uh, given some reasonable timeline where I can, you know, if not in the middle of a committee meeting or, or whatever. Um, so I, I just find that, that physical presence, and then, by the way, they can have the physical presence, that the same, you know, it's, it's in the same room, it's just 10 feet up in the air in the balcony as opposed to right on the floor. And that seemed to hurt feelings, I guess. And, yeah, so, I, so as a reporter, I can, and I'll just say for myself, there's that eye contact that happens. Yeah. So I've, I've sat on those areas there. Yeah. The, and press row. And, and press row. And so there'll be debate or conversation that's taken place. And I, I don't do jackets very well, so I've not been able to spend much time yeah, in the Senate. But, but, you know, I've looked out there and it'll be like, you'll see the eye roll or you'll see <laughs> the, you know, the conversation happens a lot easier because you have that, that physical presence is yeah. fairly close. Yeah. Um, uh, much akin to the Senate, or not the Senate, the uh, supervisor meetings. Right. So, I mean, when, and you speak of the fourth estate, we've we've tried to show that you know, even local news can make an impact with that. Right. We've had supervisors that probably acted inappropriately. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to make that argument that I, I think to attend the fourth estate, we, we're going to have to yeah. find a way to bring some press back to press row within the Senate just for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't disagree. If, if I were calling the shots, they would be back there. I would also tell you there were only ever, uh, one, two or three people ever there. Uh, you know, Rod from the Gazette was there every day. And back in the day, Bill from the uh, register was there until they retired him. And then, and then the register never had any presence there again. So, and uh, Radio Iowa, Kay Henderson may be there uh, sometimes, but, but yet I see all those people all the time out in the hallway. Right. Or out in the rotunda, so, and they, they don't have any questions for me out there. Well, and I'm guilty. I, I, I called it right up front. Me and Jackets don't get along very well, and there is, there is a lot more formality within the Senate. If there you've is. never been up there, there's a lot more formality that happens in the Senate versus the House. Yeah, it, it is. And uh, so, yeah, me and the Senate have probably not, I'm, I'm kind of the, the country kind of person and a little more laid back. And Yeah, and I could argue both sides of that too, you know, but then uh, in a way you could say it's stuffy and it's whatever. I would say there's a dignity there that we try to maintain and respect and civility and all those sorts of things. So, And I'm not arguing against that because definitely the that sort of dragging our feet towards the modern era, so to speak, maybe is our a place where we can hope that we find that ability to compromise. Right. Um, so back to your reelection, we, we're kind of tell us what, what to expect from, from your campaign or are you out shaking hands well, or meeting new people? What are, what are we kind of, it's, looking? it's so new. I, I actually did not contemplate this until, uh, 10 days ago, 11 days ago when suddenly it, uh, started to work on me and uh, so it's kind of been of a whirlwind I talked to my wife and I talked to a few key people then I, I talked to my siblings I sent them an email last uh, Sunday to um, get their input and value their their thoughts uh, and then I uh, I talked to the announced candidate I didn't want him to hear it from anyone else I talked to him personally in private on Tuesday, and then the announcement came out Wednesday. So, so there's not been any time to develop a campaign. We're in the middle of the session. It was funnel week. There's a lot going on. Uh, my my plan will be to um, 
start that process, get some campaign literature printed up, get some uh, start fundraising efforts and that sort of thing. And when I have time and the weather's fit, I'll start start knocking on doors. Well, I was going to say in, in this part of the state, typically the the big election is the primaries. Right. So um, I'm, I'm assuming that you're probably going to be gearing that up here. Pretty yeah. Quick. Yeah. I mean, time goes fast. The primary, I think, is June 7th. So uh, and we will be in session until, uh, you know, somewhere around the end of April. That leaves you basically the month of May. You can't do it all then, so you got to get started. So who really grabbed Ken Rosenboom by the ear and said, hey, you know, you'd really be, we'd hate to lose you. We, we'd we like you to, to continue in this. Well, district. I'll give you two pieces of that answer. Uh, I've had encouragement all along from a lot of colleagues, um, a lot of constituents, uh, just a lot of people uh, encouraged me, encouraging me to not retire. Uh, but I expected that, and I put that all aside. Uh, and then I, I can't even tell you really what happened on Monday. Um, I got an email from a person I respect a lot, and that email started the thought process on my behalf. And you know I'm a man of faith, and I believe the Lord just said, Ken, I'm not sure you're done with this work yet. So that's just as bluntly as I can state it. So people have... Well, acknowledge, I mean, that you have a pretty close tie with Farm Bureau. Farm Bureau is is pretty strong, sure. of course, in the agricultural sure. community. I think Iowa is starting to have a love-hate relationship with Farm Bureau. Sometimes they, you know, of yeah. course, the, the things that they do that are good, and then other people will say, well, they've had, they overreach. And, right. And, and I did... Was was that part of... No, they weren't even... Uh, they, they were actually among the last... I got a... Uh, th their lobbyist, uh, just so you know, their lobbyist came up to me yesterday morning at the Capitol, and he said, "I start. I heard something last night. I don't. Is it, is it true? Yeah, yeah, it is true. But no, they. You know, there, there's maybe part of the problem, Ken, um, to tie back to what we're talking about. Farm Bureau is Farm Bureau. The education community, the teachers, the teachers union is is another entity." Those two are probably among the most powerful lobbies in the state. And sides are always chosen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because I'm elected, I get painted as either pro or con, for instance, with those two groups. The truth is, it's both and neither. Because I, on the education committee, I do an awful lot of work on education things. and. And I'm not their enemy. I also have to tell Farm Bureau at times that I don't agree with them. And people can accept that or not, but that is reality. So two powerful lobbies quite often opposed to each other. I'm in the middle. I feel like I'm fair to both, and I feel like I use my own best judgment on uh, virtually all, all matters. So... I have to let the voters decide whether my integrity is intact or not. Well, I'm going to go back to my compromise because that seems to be the theme of my life here the last six yeah. months is trying to find a way to get people to have a conversation again. So, of course, right now, and you mentioned the education, So, and I'm not either for or against. As a journalist, I'm not to take sides on this, but what's, what's the percentage that the Iowa how or the, the Iowa... Cong not Congress, I, I'm all tongue tied. Legislature. Legislature, there we go, thank you, I can't speak today. So is looking at for an increase for... Well, we actually passed that bill this week and the governor signed it yesterday. It's a 2.5% increase in K-12 through funding. Mm -hmm. It also, which is 160 million new dollars going into K-12 through education in Iowa for the next fiscal year. Um, it also, can, we, we continue to work on this transportation equity. Rural schools have to pay a lot more for transportation. We don't think that's appropriate because it's, it's the money spent in the classroom the, where the child benefits. Getting them to and from, from school isn't, um, uh, it does, doesn't help teach kids. So uh, 
we continue to address transportation equity. And then over the years, back I think in the 70s, there was this silly uh, uh, per pupil funding was different for some school districts than it was for others. Well, that's never been fair. It's never been right. But it was never fixed until we started working on that. Uh, five years ago, I think, uh, the, the, the difference from one school to another, maybe if it's great as $185 per student, and we keep chipping away at that. Uh, we're down to 145 difference now, I think. It takes time to work that down. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's there. Uh, it's, it, it takes by far the biggest chunk of new spending, again, like it does every year. And uh, well, so what's the percentage at this year? And so I, and I'm leading into this because we're to, looking uh, the percentage increase. Well, the, the percentage increase, but the, the total part of the budget budget. So it's what it was. It? It's always 56. It's always 56, 57 percent of the state budget is for education. Okay. That that number includes our region universities, our community colleges and that sort of thing. But by far, the biggest amount of that is is public schools. So it, and maybe I was unfair when I when I earlier when I said it was Joe Biden's inflation, but wherever inflation is and wherever we want to lay that blame right now, nearly seven percent. How do how do we reconcile that two point five with? And I'm sure people are pointing at that seven percent inflation as we're not we're not keeping up with that. And and po well, folks that are you know you say that you're anti education will probably point towards that. And well, number one. Uh, the taxpayers are also experiencing 7%. The people that are paying the school system are also experiencing that. Let's not lose sight of that. Beyond that, let me say this. I always, try to always, take a big picture view of things. And it really works here. Uh, there, I still get emails talking about us cutting education. We have never... In my 10 years in the Iowa Senate, we have never cut education. We have always increased it every year. So people that are saying that we're cutting it are not telling the truth. We need to establish that. The other thing that, when I talk about the big picture, let's go back to the time period from 2012 to 2022, a 10-year period. My 10 years in the Senate, K-12 through education has increased by $1.12 billion in Iowa. If you go to the Bureau of Statistics, the Federal Bureau of Statistics, find an inflation calculator and plug in 2012 numbers, add inflation to it, we are 6% above the inflation rate with education in Iowa. So, those numbers are real, uh, they're raw numbers, they're big picture numbers, and I think they give lie to the fact that we're not keeping pace with inflation. Now, in, in a year when inflation's grown 7%, no, we're not keeping track with that. We didn't cause that, we can't fix that. We can't fix what's going on in Washington by charging the taxpayers so that we can pay the teachers 7.5%. Uh, we can't hold them harmless on inflation while we penalize everybody else. Right. So, well, I'm going to wrap this up because I picked on you quite a bit already. Today. Hey, I, this is why I wanted to talk, was just to have a chance to visit and catch up. And yeah, I have. I've, both professionally and personally. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to catch up with you at the State House yet this year. I typically try and make it a few times, and between the COVID and... and uh, Cold yeah. weather. I don't think I've been as active as, as you, I could have you, been. You have plenty of uh, activity. You have plenty on your plate. I know that. So, well, I, I appreciate that, but sometimes I feel like I uh, could find time for more. Um, but anyway, well, so Senator Ken Roseboom, he's going to be running for election. Is, it wouldn't consider be re-election. It would be an election. Yeah, well, it's re-election in the sense that I am a sitting senator, I guess, so. Yeah, you can call it anything you want to. Okay, well, so he's running for uh, U.S. or the <laughs> Iowa. See, I'm, I'm getting all these U.S. and <laughs> Iowa yeah. terminologies all mixed and up. And I ask today. people don't confuse us with Washington because we're not broken like Washington. 
So I always hear that there's a lack of oxygen in Washington. That's why they seem smart here, and when they get to Washington, they're not quite as yeah they yeah they seem to they seem to lose it. But so we don't have that problem in Des Moines. Oh yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people that will say. Uh, Brad Zahn always likes to say, you know, there's something about that Golden Dome up there that just sucks the brains out of people that come there, <laughs> that sit there. Well, I don't think it's quite that bad, but then, uh, you know, it, it's uh, you have to stay in touch with home and with constituents because that can become its own little world up there, and that's not good. I was gonna say things like eggs and issues great give an yeah. opportunity for yeah for those that help serve the public to hear what the public has to say. So yeah. kudos to uh those that help put those forums on. So yeah. once again, thanks again, uh Senator Rosenboom for uh, spending some time with us this morning and uh we look forward to uh hearing more from you at Eggs and Issues. Stay tuned. <laughs>